wanna finish what you started? You came to the right place. The girls that you came with, you might have to part with. Depending on how this thing shakes. Wabatosa, Kenosha. Live, it's the pride of Perth. Andrew Hasty, the man, the myth, the legend. Andrew, where where are you right now? You look it looks like a very scholarly setting. Uh, I'm in my home study, about 70 minutes south of the Perth CBD, which you were you were at what last August, right? Where we where we caught up. So I'm on the beach, about 70 minutes south of Perth. And that is that where you grew up, or where are you from? No, no, no I was born in I was born on the east coast in rural victoria and uh, then i moved to sydney when i was four spent about 16 years there then went to canberra to our defense force academy which is tri-service three years in darwin and this is my uh, 10th year in perth so i moved all over the place wow three what were three years in darwin like it was great man it was uh, it felt like the weekends were 72 hours rather than 48 you know, almost 100 percent humidity during the wet season. Very relaxed. It's a good gig if you're a U.S. Marine and you get posted out there. It's not a bad gig. What's the current makeup of? I know we know the Marines are out there, um, but there are there Aussie uh, soldiers there as well, or what's? Uh, is it just just Marines? No, that's right. We had a uh, mechanized brigade up there, and um, we now have the, the that facility is also used by the U.S. Marines. So we're building a really um, great relationship, not just at the strategic level, but down at the tactical level as well. Um, so we've got a, a port there as well. There's um, air assets. There's plenty of plenty of stuff going on in Darwin. That's awesome. Um, by the way, I don't know if this thing is going to... You can tell I run a very professional podcast here. I don't know if this is going to like toggle back and forth automatically like it does on Zoom, but we're no longer allowed to use Zoom for a variety of reasons that we don't need to go into or we can get all into later. But as I figure this, oh, here, I'm going to share the screen here. Uh, no, I'm not going to share the screen. Uh, God, this is going to get edited out maybe later. All right. I screwed this up, H. Sorry. No, that's cool, man. There we go. All right. It's all good. Okay. So, um, first of all, in your honor, I'm wearing this, uh, this Wallabies scarf that I picked up when I was in Australia, which happens to conveniently be Packers colors as well. But as I understand it, there's, first of all, there's two different tiers of rugby in Australia. And depending on where That's you right. are in the country, you might root for a different type of rugby. And there are very strong opinions about both of them. So from the area you represent, what are the rugby allegiances and what other sports are most important in Perth? Well, Australia has uh, four football codes, really. We've got soccer or football. Uh, we have Australian rules football, which is based off Gaelic football and a lot of fit dudes wearing singlets and tight shorts running around the footy field chasing a ball for about you know 80 minutes. And then you've got rugby league and rugby union. Um, rugby league came out of the north of England and rugby union is what you know it in the Un United States, played at college level. Um, so uh, AFL states or, or Australian Football League states, Victoria mainly, and Western Australia and South Australia. So if you're from New South Wales, you're big on rugby league, rugby union, the same in Queensland. So look, the reason why uh, we haven't challenged you guys in, in your football is because we're just so diversified and um, you know, we just <laughs> we can't get it together. So which one did I see when I was there in Perth? Was you, you, it league? That was union. Rugby, rugby union. I was surprised. I was surprised at how civilized the whole thing was. I had in my mind this image of just hooligans, everyone just drunk out of their minds, fights breaking out in the stands. Now, certainly it was brutal on the field, but the whole thing was rather civilized. I was surprised by that. Is that a difference between union versus league? Uh, look, I've got to be really careful here because uh, supporters have their strong, strongly held views on this, but. Um, out in WA, particularly those who, who who watch the rugby union, we have a lot Western of Western Australia for the uninitiative is WA. Yeah, sorry, Western Australia. That's right. We have a lot of South African migrants. We have a lot of uh, migrants from the UK who are very uh, proper and, and like order and discipline and structure. And uh, so generally, the rugby union matches are pretty tame. But if you went to an AFL game in in Perth, it would be a different story. So, and it, I assume it's uh, morning where you are right now. That's right. Yeah, just after, what, 7.40 here. 
Explain to uh, the audience of Northeast Wisconsin, the tens of people that are listening, what is a gunfire brekkie? So a gunfire brekkie on Anzac Day, which is the 25th of April of every year, um, celebrating the first time that Australian troops came under fire on the Gallipoli Peninsula on um, the 25th of April, 1915. A gunfire breakfast is, um, you know, a bit of rum in your coffee and what we call Anzac biscuits, which are, you know, just basically lots of sugar and a bit of oatmeal. And um, so every, every 25th of April, Anzac Day, we get up at dawn and we have a gunfire breakfast at, at dawn and then we remember our fallen and those who've served. I have a feeling I'll be able to start that tradition here in Northeast Wisconsin. That'll, there'll be, you'll have a very friendly, receptive audience here. Um, I, think, I think it's more rum than, than coffee most of the time. If you make it brandy, we consume more brandy in Wisconsin than the entire uh, United States of America combined. What, why is that? It's brandy old fashions. It's like a Wisconsin cocktail. It's just a, I actually don't know when and how we became the brandy old fashioned capital of the world, but it is nonetheless a reality. The other phrase I learned, and I swear we'll get on to serious topics after this, and I don't know if this is a pejorative phrase or a, uh, a swear word in your language, whatever that is. Uh, I heard uh, people in WA described as cashed up bogans. What does that mean? Or, or cubs. Cubs. Cashed up bogans. Yeah, very, uh, uh, very liquid people who, who work away. So we, we're a huge resources sector here. Uh, we export iron ore, a lot of iron ore, gas. And of course, we need people to work in fairly remote areas. So we have people flying away for, you know, one week on, one week off, whatever the swing might be. And uh, they come back and they're, they're pretty liquid during their rest time. And so they, they like to, to spend big. So during the boom time, uh, jet skis, um, big, big SUVs, uh, you name it. And uh, that's, that's what we're kind of known for. And, and you, proudly, we're, we're proud about it too. <laughs> that's good. So you have, you have cubs. We have something called fibs to describe yeah. the, the people from Illinois that come to Door County uh, in the summer. It's uh, the F is a bad word. And then right. Illinois, and then the B is also a bad word that rhymes with asterisks. Um, so <laughs> fibs and cubs, uh, not quite the same thing. Go. Uh, but the theme of this podcast will be the underappreciated similarities between Western Australia and Northeast Wisconsin. So just keep yes. that in mind. Okay, so you grew up in a variety of different places in Australia. When was the first time you started to think about joining the military? So my grandfather in World War II um, was a wireless air gunner aboard a Catalina um, aircraft. And he flew in the Pacific and he was involved in air sea rescue operations so you know us bombers would take off and he and his crew would fly behind them if a plane was shot down they'd, they'd land and scoop up the pilot uh so very very versatile aircraft and on the 31st of march 1945 two australian um air crew were shot down and they got um, tasked to go and rescue them Anyway, they went in under heavy fire, multiple anti-aircraft uh, batteries, machine guns and whatnot. And he was shot in the stomach um, whilst, whilst under fire, firing back at the Japanese. He was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross, which is the second highest honor um, wow. in our award system. And uh, was kept alive by a U.S. medic uh, by the name of Sergeant Mayberry from the state of Virginia. Anyway. Um, when I was a young boy, I remember him distinctly I was staying at his house and he lifted up his pajama top and showed me his, his gunshot um, wounds and um, the scars there. And uh, from that day on, I sort of thought that that was something that young men did. They served their country and it was sort of a rite of passage for me. So I felt I felt drawn to it. And um, that was that was how it was going to happen. Is your Wikipedia page correct in suggesting there was a period at, you have a very detailed Wikipedia page, by the way, sure. at which you were thinking about becoming a, a foreign correspondent or a journalist? That's right. So I sort of lost my way there for a little bit. And, um, <laughs> uh, well, I, was, I mean, a foreign correspondent, you know, you get to see a fair bit of stuff. And I was after adventure at the time. And my, uh, and of course, 9-11 happened. I was probably about the same age as you, around 18. And um, I remember going to university and and I was studying an arts degree and people in, in one of the tutorials arguing that, 
you know, somehow it was America's fault that this had happened and um, putting forward pretty much uh, a very relativist position on this. And I just thought, you know what, this is a waste of time. Um, history is, is on the move and I want to be part of it. I want to serve my country. And so I joined up and, and um, spent 13 years in the military after that. And what was your initial specialty and assignments that you had prior to joining the SAS? So I was a cavalry officer, uh, which meant I had a, a an LAV troop. Uh, so the Marines run LAVs. I had six of those. And um, in a conventional setting, we do reconnaissance. Um, in the wars that you and I experienced, um, a lot of convoy escort, um, overwatch and whatnot. So that took me to Afghanistan in, in 2009 right in the middle of the surge. Wow. And where in Afghanistan were you? Uh, Uruzgan province, which is a bit of a, you know, I don't know how you describe it, maybe the Alabama of Afghanistan. It's, um, it's, it's rural. It's, um, it's, it's a fair way away from Kabul, um, but they're tough people and they fight hard. And how long were your deployments? Uh, six months, six months. Um, we did fairly short ones. I did do, I was meant to do nine months for the first one, but I went to yeah. the SAS um, as, a, as an ops officer and, and opted to, to go back early. We did seven months in the Marine Corps, which I always thought, you know, and the Army at the time was doing, I think, 13 month deployments, which to me seems crazy. I, yeah. I, I think six months, you, you're still you're reasonably fresh at the, at the end of it, which is, <clears throat> excuse me, important. For the welfare of the guys and girls, right? Yeah. So how did you, okay, so then take me through, for the people that don't know how it works, you know, how do you, how does one get into the SAS? What is the SAS? You know, help help the, the, the people in Northeast Wisconsin understand this crazy thing you signed up to do. Sure. So the, the SAS uh, has been around since 1957 in Australia. Uh, like, like Five Eyes Nations, we had our special ops capability in World War II. Uh, and then in 57 decided to raise the SAS based on the British model. And so our, our DNA is in the UK SAS, um, and we partner with your JSOC special missions units, and we have a good relationship with them. So uh, we like to consider ourselves a, a tier one sort of special ops unit, except, uh, of course, we're not asset rich like the United States, where you guys can force project anywhere around the world at any time, basically. So uh, the SAS, it's very difficult to get into. Uh, there's a three week initial selection course and then an 18 month reinforcement cycle. And then at the end of that time, you get your Sandy Beret and that qualifies you as an operator or a shooter. And so I had to go through that that whole process. So I did selection in in July of 2010. What's the attrition rate for selection? Uh, so on on my selection, we had 130 130 people start, 42 finished, 26 were selected, and I think about 15 or so got their beret at the end of the the 18 month period. So wow. it's 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 pretty high. Yeah. And then how long were you in the SAS before you got out, and why did you decide to get out? So just short of just short of six years, I was in the SAS, and um, I've always been interested in, in public service and, and politics. I was always the guy in the, um, you know, the officers club or, or whatever who wanted to sort of debate the, the, the headlines and, and whatnot. Oh, you were that uh, guy. We hated that guy. They were usually intel guys, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, and uh, because, you know, I, I care about my country, and, and um, so I thought politics long term was always going to be my calling and um i joined the liberal party when i got back from afghanistan in 2013 very frustrated um with sort of the policy settings during that time um the challenges of working within a coalition with national caveats and um you know the, the partnering ratios that were being imposed upon us so i came back joined the liberal party which is like the republican party and uh key point there the liberal party is the conservative party which that, can that, be that's counterintuitive yeah. that's a very sound point and uh, two years later the sitting member of the seat that i now um represent canning uh died very suddenly and i i got asked if i'd like to run i, I did the primary or pre-selection as we call it here there were seven six other candidates got through the primary and then contested the by-election and was elected almost five years ago this September 19th. And you had, so you had no political experience. Had anyone in your family run for office for you? Actually, you had military service in your family, but 
how how does one how does one go from no political experience to running and winning a campaign and so much of our campaigns are dominated by fundraising. What are the demands of doing that in Australia? Well, because it was a by-election and the context is is really important. So our prime minister at the time, Tony Abbott, was under a lot of pressure, um, his leadership. And so the by-election was sort of going to be a, a poll on, on his leadership. So I had the full resources of the National Party diverted into my seat. So it very quickly became a, a proxy campaign for, for the prime minister as well. Um, so I was very well resourced, but certainly I, I, something I'd say to veterans is um, the, the training and the skills that you get serving in the military prepares you really well for whatever comes next. And I remember rocking up and, and getting my daily briefs and being told effectively what to wear to certain events and working up talking points and preparing for debates. And uh, people were like, hey, what's the go here? You're just on time. Um, you know, you're, you're nailing your brief. I'm like, isn't that how the normal world operates? <laughs> and apparently it, it, it doesn't always operate like that. But the military trains you to a very high standard. You're always training against your weaknesses as well. And so despite it, was, despite it being a bit like drinking from the fire hose um, in terms of the, the new experiences I had to deal with, um, I felt like I was really well prepared and all those taxpayers' dollars invested in my leadership and, and, and management training and um, coping with adversity and uncertainty really set me up well. As I understand, in your first election, um, you know, maybe national security, the, despite your background, wasn't the biggest issue. Drugs were actually a big That's issue, right. correct? I mean, we, I sort of think about this. We have a huge opioid problem, you know, not only in Wisconsin, across the country. Talk a little bit about sort of the meth problem in WA and, and kind of how that played in your first election. Sure. So back in, I think it was 2018, uh, wastewater analysis across the country indicated that regional Western Australia had the highest usage of meth in the country. Wow. Right. So um, it, it's a massive problem. It's 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 impacted families, um, our, our social fabric, big, big problem. And back in 2015, when I first ran, it was certainly an issue that kept popping up in, in community forums and town halls. And uh, so my, my pledge in that campaign was to, to provide a new service which targeted uh, kids age, 20, uh, age 16 to, to 24. They're sort of the, the bracket that we want to hit. And, um, you know, two years, three years later, we delivered a, a $10 million facility, um, which is really um, best practice nationally. In fact, we had people wow. come out from Colorado not long ago and visit and check it out uh, because obviously Colorado has got its own issues um, with, with drug use. And so, yeah, that was something I was really proud of. But uh, my view is we have to be preventative. Very, it's, it's a lot better to get people off, um, you know, the pathway to drugs than try and treat them when they're already in addiction and, and struggling with all the other associated issues. Well, this leads to a, a, maybe a broader question of, so you get elected, um, and how obviously you have a background in foreign policy, national security, and military issues in particular. How do you, as a member of parliament, um, how do you how do you uh, divide up your time? How do you focus? Do you have sort of a set of priorities based on the area you represent, or is it just a function of your own personal interests? I, and I would say candidly, one of the things I struggle with and have since I got elected is, you know, there's so many different issues. You know, how do you specialize and go deep enough in a in a set of issues to develop the requisite expertise while still paying attention to everything that your constituents want you to pay attention to? That's that's a really good question. Um, I got a lot of advice when I first got into politics and it took me a while to, to work it out. Uh, but I got told basically, you know, stick to your strengths, focus on 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 what you know and really master that. So a national security background lived experience in, in sort of the foreign policy realm, um, not so much as a, a policymaker, but as someone who had to execute policy. And so that's where I focused. In terms of uh, my constituent work, uh, you know, I think it's so important that you actually um, live in your community, engage with your community, understand um, their needs. And so our basic philosophy is work our butts off here in Canning so that we can make the big um, calls in Canberra, um, and that, that sort of drives my team as well. So we're, we're, our focus is on infrastructure, new roads, new rail, um, telecommunications, those sorts of things which 
to set the conditions for prosperity, encourage and incentivize investment in our region. We're peri-urban, which means we sit on the outer metro, uh, traditionally uh, sort of rural. We have uh, two massive Alcoa refineries here in, in my electorate. Um, we produce something like, you know, 11 to 12 percent of the world's alumina and, and bauxite out of here. So, uh, yeah, getting getting the conditions to keep getting the conditions set to keep those industries going is, is really important. So you have obviously distinguished yourself in a short period of time for your writing and your speaking and your thinking on foreign policy in general, but uh, China, Australia relations in particular. Maybe I, I'm trying to figure out what the best way to start this conversation would be, which which is maybe when you came in in, in 2015, mm -hmm. what was the mood in the country or what was the consensus position on China? And then how do you think that's changed in the intervening five years? You know, had had Silent Invasion been written, you know, had Garnot, 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 uh, Garnot Garno. done what he does? Uh you know, what was what what is the change you've seen in that short period of time? Well, when I came in, it was September 2015. Um, is, Islamic State was still very much in the forefront of everyone's minds. Uh, the last job I did in, in the military was four months deployed, effectively watching ISIS videos and, and studying their propaganda as part of a, a U.S. task force. And uh, by the time I went into politics, that was still very much... Um, front of mind for many Australians, and that was pretty much the national security discussion. Um, and then around uh, late 2017, um, with after the work of, of people like John Garno had, had done a lot of shaping of, um, I guess, the, the, the political square on this issue, our government moved to introduce what we call the Espionage and Foreign Interference um, legislation. And uh, a big suite of legislation a number of different things, updating our statute books for, for you know, new definitions of, of espionage, sabotage, um, foreign interference, foreign influence, and also um, setting up the, you know, um, systems to protect our critical infrastructure. Um, so our ports, our electricity grids and, and the like. And that's what, that was, a, it took six months of committee work to get those bills out and back into the House and the Senate. It was a lot of hard work from, from my committee particularly. Um, and Clive was influential again during that period, um, publishing and, and making the public case. And so we've sort of been on a journey. That was 2018, the bills passed. Uh, and then just in the last 18 months or so, the public, after the publication of Silent Invasion and um, just a lot of speeches and op-eds by a number of different people have finally started to turn. And now people are really focused on this issue in the wake of the COVID-19 outbreak. So leading up to that legislative sea change and the espionage laws in particular, was there a single incident that forced people to wake up or was it just an accumulation of stories? I mean, when do you think it started to kind of pick up momentum? I, I, I think it really started to fix that in people's minds when the Port of Darwin was sold to uh, a Chinese company by the name of Landbridge. And it looked like um, that our foreign investment review board and, and other oversight mechanisms could have done a far better job of thinking and thinking about and protecting the national interest. And so that's just been an issue that's just been burning away for five years or so. People are still angry about the sale of the Port of Darwin. And I know the United States was, was, was rather unhappy as well. Um, so that's kind of that, 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 that's been emblematic of this whole discussion um, and people's frustration. Uh, but certainly, you know, there's been, you know, the, the work done by by people in Parliament and the media to move this issue along. Our our free media has done a great job of exposing instances of, of foreign interference and, and foreign influence. Um, so yeah, it's 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 a complex ecosystem. Uh, but certainly, if you don't have the media and politicians taking risks and writing stories and leading the way, uh, change doesn't happen. Well, I think it, it's really important to, for people that don't understand. My own view is that Australia was not only the canary in the coal mine for the expansion of Chinese influence um, and just the way in which they sort of ruthlessly wage economic and ideological warfare, but also was really the leader of the free world in terms of the first country to take massive steps 
to counter that. And in many ways, our own response, I think, has mirrored yours in very interesting ways, right? I mean, so you talk about these espionage laws. One of the most significant things we've done since I've been in Congress in the last three years has been to revise our entire um, uh, the entire process through which we review investments that come into the United States, foreign investments in the United States. And I think it's been interesting. I mean, really, you know, since Trump has been elected and since his inauguration in 2017, the, though he is a divisive figure for many, the fundamental premise of his foreign policy, which is to say China is the pacing threat, indo pacom is our top priority theater, and everything else must plan around that, there's actually no disagreement about that. That's a, that's the new bipartisan consensus. Is is there a similar sort of bipartisan consensus in Australia around these issues, or is there still kind of a a strong accommodationist view of China uh, among your colleagues? No, I think I think the same shift that's happening in Washington D.C. is also happening in Canberra. Uh, just last weekend, uh, we did some media as a group of MPs, we had people represented from both major parties and the two sort of factions in the Labour Party, so the left and the right faction, on the same ticket with us, suggesting, hey, we need to rethink our, our, our relationship, we need to uh, make sure that we're never so vulnerable again. So I think that, that media hit out on the weekend indicates that, yes, we've had the same sort of bipartisanship and there is consensus on this issue. It's taken a while, it hasn't been easy, but I think we're, we're definitely there. And for some people, you know, it's it's questions of sovereignty. For others, it's it's around uh, questions of human rights. When we talk about the Uyghurs in Xinjiang province, uh, so so different aspects um, resonate with with different people. But certainly, there is a consensus that you know um, China is is a challenge for us all going ahead. Now, it's not to say it's um, not without controversy, right? I think I w the day we got there last year. To the conference where I saw you last, you had just published an op-ed in which you were, if I remember the gist of it, you were very critical of the Chinese Communist Party, and you're effectively saying we need to wake up. Uh, we can't be lulled into a false sense of security here uh, and get complacent. And if, if I remember correctly, there was some pushback and, and some criticism. Yeah. So, what 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 was kind of the substance of the pushback? And have you personally experienced any blowback from staking out? I think what could be accurately termed a hawkish though I would say a realist position on China. Yeah, yeah, I would say I would say uh, a realist position as well. Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, we're, we're, we're known as the, the, the Hawks. You know, it was it was pretty um, it was pretty moderate when I read back over it, um, particularly in, in the present day. Uh, but certainly I made a metaphor. I said, you know, economic liberalization. We all believe that economic liberalization of China would lead to democratization, right? sort of democratic peace theory in play. And I said, that was our Maginot line, just like the French built a Maginot line uh, to protect against, you know, uh, another scenario like World War One with Germany as a rising power. And people misrepresented that and suggested that I had written that China were, were, were basically Nazis, which I never mentioned the word Nazi. Um, yeah. But this was very effective propaganda to sort of diminish my views as hysterical and, and, and unqualified and, and over the top. Um, but what I was really about, what I was really trying to argue about was like, how do we contain a great power or manage a great power in the region, which shares a very different political system to us, very different ideology, and, you know, who, who is very, very aggressive in the pursuit of its strategic objectives. And essentially, I said, if, if, we're, if we're not thinking about these things, then decisions will be made for us because we'll be completely reactive. And um, as it turns out, I, I think, you know, six to eight months later, people are now starting to think, OK, yeah, it's a good point. Um, we've seen how vulnerable we are. Um, you know, we're trying to source PPE along with the United States um, and we're trying to kickstart manufacturing um, to, to make that happen uh, because, we, we've, we have offshored a lot of our industry, like you guys, and if we want to be resilient, these are some of the things that we need to think about. Um, is it? But you had subsequently tried to go to China, right, on a on an official trip, and That's your trip right. got cancelled. Okay, so yeah, I got a lot of I got a lot of criticism, right? So the the Chinese embassy here condemned me um, for my op-ed, called me a cold warrior, um, 
and all the rest of it, which was a I wore as a badge of honor. Um, I then got approached by a um, a not for profit who who does trips into China, China Matters. I thought, hey, you know, why not confound my critics and and take up the offer? I got asked to go with another senator, a young guy, James Patterson, a um, couple of years younger than us both. Great guy, really solid on this issue, and. Uh, our, our visas were lodged and the Chinese government said, no, you can't come, you're not allowed. And then released a statement um, saying, yeah, you're banned. And unless you repent, you're not coming to China. I mean, and so that that press statement did all the work for us. We didn't have to say a single thing. Um, and I think that was another really important turning point where the Australian people went, OK, this doesn't seem right. Wow. What's going on here? Friends don't do this. Did they prescribe a mode of repentance? You know, did you have to say a few Hail Marys or what was the... We, we just had to recant our, uh, I think it was like, you know, neo-colonialist views or something. Um, <laughs> you know, apparently we're puppets of the United States. Cold uh, warrior, neo-colonialist, uh, colonialist, uh, Andrew Hasty. Why do your friends call you H? Is it just H, the letter H? Yeah, I, well, one of my good mates at the academy, this Kiwi guy, he just one day said, hey, I'm going to call you H. In the, that was in a the good accent. New Zealand accent. There. <laughs> yeah. And then it just stuck and uh, I'd sign off on it. And um, yeah, so it just depends H. how people say it. it's either H or H, depending <laughs> on how, how much they speak the Queen's English. What is the Australian view of Kiwis? What are the stereotypes? Uh, Kiwis. Well, we offered them to federate with us, right? They, they got a mention in our constitution, but they went their own way. So they're kind of cousins. One of the, look, we love them. They they beat us at rugby most of the time, um, but you know they're they they they're good people. One thing that's really annoying though, if you're out door knocking, campaigning, you knock on the door. Uh, this is if you know you, you're not sure about you know if you've never spoken to a constituent before and you're just randomly door knocking. Um, and uh, a Kiwi answers the door and talks to you for like you know ten minutes or something, and then says, "Hey, by the way, I can't vote, eh?" But keep it up, you know. Good job. <laughs> I love that. We, 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 have, we have a lot of Kiwis who, uh, who who love to tell you at the end of long conversations that they, they don't vote, but they'll tell you their view of the world and ask you to legislate it. Well, they are bizarrely dominant at rugby with the All Blacks, but the one and only rugby game I've ever seen at your stadium in Perth, uh, which is amazing, by the way, the Wallabies beat the All Blacks for yeah. the game one of the Bledisloe Cup, which hadn't happened in a long time. So it was a cool thing. Yeah, that was that was that was super special and also out in WA. The, look, the one thing I will say about the Kiwis is that their pace of rugby is amazing. They just have this this drive and tenacity, and um, their decision cycle is just rapid. Um, you know, the John Boyd's theory of the OODA loop. That's how they practice their rugby, always wow. making you react. And so I, I often think, hey, if we ever, God forbid, had to go to war again, um, the Kiwis would field some pretty fierce infantry battalions if they if they retask their rugby teams. <laughs> so this is we'll we'll try and bring this back to China uh, with sure. an Ill, inelegant uh, return. So New Zealand has also been in what I would say is the right place on five G and yes. Huawei. Uh, as yeah. have you guys. Maybe talk to us a little bit about the state of the 5G debate in Australia, and when was the point at which it became the official position not to allow Huawei and ZTE to compete for the future of your internet? Sure, so August 2018 was the decision. Um, that was when the decision was made public about uh, banning high-risk vendors from our future 5G network, including Huawei and, and ZTE. Interestingly, it was during the week of um, the leadership contest where Malcolm Turnbull uh, was challenged by Peter Dutton. Americans wouldn't be familiar with that, but it, it kind of, the decision kind of was uh, overshadowed, let's say, by by leadership changes um, at the highest levels of government. Um, so it was it was largely unreported, but uh, it was it was bipartisan. It was done on the basis of our intelligence agencies. Um, there's no question about it. There's been no pushback. Wow. Um, it's done and dusted. And it's also important to remember that our national broadband network in 2012, when it was when it was commenced, um, Huawei was banned from that as well. So there's a history on a bipartisan basis of, of, of governments, both um, liberal and labor, taking the hard calls on, on this question. 
which is, I think, what makes the British position a bit more difficult. Well, one, it's difficult, I think, for us to understand that they're hesitant. But to the extent I understand it, it's because so much of their existing architecture is Huawei equipment that there is a cost to ripping it out and replacing it. And that's why you've seen this call for isolating the core from the periphery. So what you're saying is Australia didn't have that problem because you had back in 2012, you had said no to Huawei at that point. That, that's right. Our, our main provider, Telstra, uh, had never used Huawei gear. So it was less of an issue. So I, I kind of, I'm sympathetic to the British, but the, the question I ultimately pose is, you know, can you put a price on, on sovereignty? And I don't think you can. Well, and I, our mutual friend Tom Tugan had has has um, spoken very eloquently about that, um, and I hope he wins the day. I think he's the right man for the right moment, a very difficult moment. But I just think, in terms of you know our alliances and our friendships, I mean, if we can't get the Five Eyes Alliance to agree on an issue this fundamental, I really worry about the implications for the future of that mm. partnership, and you know. I love NATO. I love all our other, but there is no closer set of like-minded countries and our cooperation on a day by day, minute by minute basis in the intelligence community is really something to behold. And I don't know if we can't convince, do, is, is that, do you talk about that aspect of it uh, in Australia? And does the British debate kind of worry you from a future of five eyes perspective? Well, yeah, I, I think, after making this tough to call, tough call in August 2018, you know our government, our government led on this internationally. We were ahead of the pack, and so then to have like-minded democracies come out and say, oh, you know what, those concerns, well, you know they might apply to you, but they don't to us. It really undermines our position. And then when you have, um, you know, China, for instance, pushing really hard um, for, for Huawei in the diplomatic sphere. And, um, you know, our message is being questioned by, by, by allies. It, it makes it really difficult. So, um, you know, that Five Eyes uh, family, it's family, right? It's, it's, it's critical. And, yeah, we, you know, to, 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 to maintain trust and solidarity, we need to be united around some of these fundamental questions, as you've said. Um, do you have former Australian politicians that are effectively lobbying for Huawei and ZTE. Do you, I mean, we're seeing that um, in in Washington, D.C., where we don't know how much they're getting paid, but former high-level officials, both executive branch, security experts, and former senators in some, some cases are now being paid to sort of go out there and say, hey, nothing to see here. Huawei is great. Don't worry about it. Um, is there a similar phenomenon going on in Australia? Uh, yeah, and, and you mentioned it, um, U.S. officials, President George W. Bush's cyber guy came out to Australia recently and was and was pushing the Huawei barrel, you know, um, or barrel, wow. barrow, wheelbarrow. There we go. Um, he was pushing it hard, right? Um, we we have we have something similar, but this is why the legislation in 2018 was so important. We we introduced what we call a foreign influence transparency scheme, which is sort of model of FARA, but it's modernised and optimised for the current environment. And so, if you're a former public official or a, a cabinet minister in a government, and you get out and you start representing a company that, that has links to a, a foreign entity or a foreign government, um, then you have to register on the foreign influence transparency scheme. So sure, go ahead, but you know the Australian people need to know that you're working for a foreign government. So if you're going to write op-eds or appear on television, that needs to be made very clear. I think most people wouldn't understand, you know, though you didn't have the immediate problem of having to rip up and replace Huawei or ZTE gear for your internet infrastructure, you are very much in the immediate neighborhood of China. Uh, yeah. You are also a massive trading partner with China. So this was a decision that carried enormous risk, at least economically, correct? Huge. One in three export dollars go to China. We send a lot of uh, coal, a lot of gas, a lot of iron ore. Uh, gold, you name it, bauxite out of Western Australia, and then, you know, agricultural products, right? You know, so beef, dairy, uh, grain, you name it. So, yeah, huge, huge risk for us. Um, but you've got to be principled about these things. And um, we can't afford to be a vassal state of anyone. We're a sovereign nation. And um, sovereignty in the future, as Mike Pompeo said, is... 
um, you know, having control over your data. If you don't control your data, then you're not sovereign. That is very well said. And I just want to foot stomp that. I mean, here you have politicians in Australia across the ideological spectrum standing up together, maybe for slightly different reasons, but effectively saying, hey, there are things more important than cheap stuff from China. Yeah. There are things more important than just how much money we're making. Sovereignty is among those things, and our values are more important than just how much money we can make trading with China. Yeah, precisely. It's ultimately a values proposition. So talk a little bit. You mentioned this before about uh, PPE uh, in coronavirus. As I understand it, we've now had some stories in Australia of Chinese uh, companies buying up key medical equipment and PPE in the months prior to it really becoming a crisis in Australia. Talk to us a little bit about, you know, we're experiencing these huge supply chain shortages here in America, single points of failure that, you know, often go back to Beijing. Talk to us a little bit about what that looks like in Australia. Sure. So our manufacturing base is, has dwindled significantly over the last 30 years, right? Um, and we buy a lot from China. Um, but interestingly, in, in January and February, when the coronavirus was really starting to kick in China, um, there was a couple of companies here, which are Chinese owned, sending its employees out to sort of fleece our shelves. And that's been well documented by the Sydney Morning Herald, um, one of our sort of oldest papers in this country. An investigative reporter, um, you know, discovered these stories through insiders and, and whatnot. And then there was a connection, you know, with with government, with you know the Chinese government, so you know there's an individual there you can maybe give your listeners a, a link or two. Um, so yeah, it's it's certainly um, a big issue, and um, this is why we need to have a discussion in this country about you know making sure that strategic industries like pharmaceuticals, PPE, um, we can we can look after ourselves if if our supply lines are cut. Yeah. So we're ha I mean we're having this debate about decoupling right to what extent can you decouple from china and it gets to your uh, a lot of what you talked about before about this failed bet on economic integration leading to democratization and it not working and i actually think this is going to dominate our politics for the next decade or at least a serious substantive part of I it agree. while we can't decouple entirely can you build moats around key industries you know whether it's 5g whether it's pharmaceuticals and how do you bring that manufacturing if not back to the United States domestically, to countries that we trust, right? You can imagine sort of a five eyes, you know, trusted industrial base. And in fact, we you are technically integrated into our national technical industrial base. Um, well, that's right. Statute. I think I think rather than talking about free trade, we need to talk about preferential trade, and um, you know, establishing relationships of preference around strategic industries. So, for example, um, rather than being reliant upon China for our pharmaceuticals, I'd rather be reliant upon the US. In an ideal situation, we'd, we'd, we'd do all our pharmaceuticals, but that may not be possible. Um, so these are the sorts of conversations that we, we need to have in the future. And that's why, you know, the US and Australia really need to think about these things um, at our level. Say, so, well, you know, what do you guys do best? What do we do best? How can we share um, information? How can we how can we trade more effectively across these strategic industries? I would assume rare earths would be an obvious Huge. area for not just Australia, but WA in particular to cooperate more closely with the United States so that we're not dependent on rare earths in China, correct? Yeah, well, that's right. So we, 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 we produce the rare earth. We don't process it. Most of the processing is done in China. So why aren't we doing value add processing here and, and shipping it direct to you guys? Now, all this costs money. So we need you know US capital to make that happen. We've, we've always... Um, being a country of, of, you know, a lot of foreign investment, that's good. Um, that's how our wool industry got going. That's how our resources sector got going. Um, so we really need people to, to be prepared to may, maybe pay a little bit extra, but have that security that the supply chains are, are solid. Um, they're doing business with friends who share the same strategic interests. You know, that, that's really interesting. And I've started to think a little bit about this. I, I think all of the as I said before, I actually think there's a bipartisan consensus around this sort of more hawkish position on China and this attempt to strengthen and shore up our supply chain and bring some manufacturing back home, for lack of a better descriptor. However, you know, I think most Americans haven't yet thought about what the cost of that is going to be 
and no doubt there will be a cost, right? In some sense, I do think over the last two decades, we've gotten addicted to cheap stuff from China, yeah. right? And curing ourselves of that addiction is going to be a very difficult and long process. That, that's right, and, and an expensive one. Um, we've also got to talk about AI as well, right? So um, no, one's, no one's arguing that we should return to the, you know, the 1940s, 50s, uh, long nine hour days in overalls working factories. Um, things have moved on. Um, so we do want manufacturing, or at least in some sectors, returned home. I think that's a good way to think about it, particularly if it's of strategic consequence. Uh, but we need to we need to pitch a vision forward, right? Um, which says, you know, business is going to look different. It's not going to be um, how we've done it in the past. We'll create jobs, but those jobs not, might not be the ones that you imagine them to be. Um, and a good point to remember is, you know, as m manufacturers start to use AI, um, there won't be a need for them to be operating offshore um, because you, why have that big logistic chain? You want you want those factories close to the market that they're serving. So I actually see great potential in the United States for sort of AI based manufacturing close to market, integrated with with your um, domestic supply chains. So in the uh, 10 or so minutes we have left, I want to talk about some more fun things um, is all this stuff about China. You know, it's very yeah. boring. Hitch. Yeah. Um, but quickly, are you what what are, what is the current sort of social distancing policy in Australia? How locked down is everything right now? What's the kind of spread you're seeing where you are? So so we're pretty much like the United States. Um, you know, it's 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 one person per four square meters. Uh, you know, you can, essential workers can go and do work and there's a definition of what is essential. Um, but my kids have not been at school, although schools are open for, for essential workers who, who need to, to, to go out there to do their job, you know, emergency people, emergency workers, police, what have you. Schools are open to care for their children. Um, movement is restricted only for essential things like shopping and, and whatnot. And in the state of WA, um, we have a hard border in place now, so you can't come from South Australia or New South Wales to Western Australia. Um, we have an interregional wow. lockdown, so we've divided the state into regions. So um, I can go up to the Perth CBD, but I can't head down to the Margaret River for a cheeky wine over the weekend, um, as, as many like to do. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we're, we're, we're pretty static, and we're actually, over the last two days, we're starting to see a drop in the number of new cases. Wow. What's the timeline for which you guys are supposed to stay under that lockdown? Uh, well, the prime, the prime minister has said six months, right? Oh, so, my gosh. And, and that's and that's that's preparing the Australian people for that reality. Wow. Um, you know, we, we've got to be we've got to, without a, a vaccine. This thing could quickly flare up. Um, but, you know, we're going to have a conversation. And the first thing we want to do is is get the, the rates of infection down, which which it seems in the last couple of days, that seems to be happening with the social distancing measures. And I see you similarly passed a massive bill providing financial assistance to people that have been disintermediated from their work because of the shutdown, right? Yeah, precisely. We, a big um, stimulus package, a number of measures. Um, but probably the most interesting one is is the government um, paying money to businesses and using their payroll to provide um, fifteen hundred dollars a fortnight to workers who who've lost their job. Um, so rather than moving people to social security, as you would say, um, keeping that close relationship between what do you guys call it superannuation or something? Yeah, we've got super as well. Um, yeah, people are allowed to crack into their superannuation, so up to ten thousand um, dollars. Both partners. Um, which I think you call it 401k, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we're, 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 rather than create new um, structures, we're, we're using existing ones. That's probably the quickest way to do it. All right, so let's get into the fun round here. So you mentioned your kids. How many kids do you have and what ages? Uh, I've got two. I've got Jonathan, who's four and a half, and Beatrice, who is two and a half. I think Tom's daughter is named Beatrice, too. If I'm remembering that correctly, Tugendhat, our mutual friend. Yeah, yeah, I'll have to check yeah. that out. That's, yeah, that's I, I could be crazy. Um, and I don't know if I'm allowed to mention this, but I'm going to anyway, so you're screwed. Uh, you are married to an American, correct? That, correct. Yeah. So how did that went, happen? So I went to the United States in 2007 to do a two-week course at, at uh, George Washington University, and uh, the first Sunday I met Ruth, and um, 
she got tickets through a friend who was working in the Bush White House to, to for us to go and watch Marine One take off. So, um, yeah, well, that was our first day, um, watching wow. George Bush walk to his helicopter. I didn't meet him. I got to pat his dog. That was about it. Um, and then seven <laughs> months later, seven months later, we get married um, at Capitol wow. Hill Baptist, just down the way from, from you guys. That is unbelievable. So is she now in Australia, or how does, how does yeah. that work? Yeah, so, so she moved from a Washington winter to a Darwin wet season. Um, and <laughs> she's lived here for, what, almost 13 years now. Um, um, so, yeah, dual citizen. My kids are dual citizens. And uh, we head back to the States, Tennessee and D.C. every two years or so. Wow. Okay, so take us through a typical day in the life of, of H, of Andrew Hasty. What I mean, how do you structure it? What's your process? When do you wake up? Let's assume you're back in uh, Canning and not in Canberra. Sure. Which is, what, is it, what does it look like? How do you deal with the chaos? So uh, because of the three-hour time difference during summer, two-hour time difference, difference during winter, um, you know, I, I try and get up as early as I can, maybe five. Yeah, for those who don't know, Australia is a pretty freaking big country. Yeah. Right. Th- think, th- th- think of the United States, but instead yes. of, what, how many people? You have 350 million people. We're 26 million. Um, <laughs> so sparsely populated. Um, so three-hour time difference. So I'll wake up in the morning and I'll have a heap of texts and emails and phone calls and whatnot. I, I put my phone on Do Not Disturb. Otherwise, I'd be waking, waking up at you know 2 a.m., 3 a.m. To, to phone calls and texts. Um, I might have media that I need to do. Uh, but my priority when I'm home is having breakfast with Ruth and the kids giving her an opportunity to go for a walk. We live down on the beach um, and get out. Uh, she, she stays at home with the kids. And um, you surf? then I'm off into the office. I don't, man. I wish I did. Yeah. Um, it's very sharky here, though. We had a shark attack, a fatal shark attack, great white. Um, a couple really? Of days ago, oh, interesting. Down the road. Yeah, don't surf. You don't want to deal with that. No. You're too valuable. I, I, su- I sucked, right? Or a stand-up paddle. Which oh, is okay. Quite, apparently, what, you know, like 35 plus year old men do uh, <laughs> when, when they can't surf. Uh, and then, you know, it's just a, you know, a, a normal day, constituent inquiries. I've got a big electorate, 6,304 square kilometers. So I'll be traveling, um, seeing people. I've, I've got a, a studio now in my office so I can do live crosses um, over East at any time. Um, otherwise I'd have to do a three hour round trip to get to a studio. So, um, Busy, full days. The one great thing about politics is that no day is ever the same, right? You would know this. Um, okay, you have a vast library behind you. Those could be just fake books. I, I don't know. I actually I don't it's, see the page. And it's just all for show, like Ikea when you go in there. What are some <laughs> books that have influenced you or just maybe some you're reading right now? What, uh, when, you, when you relax and, and you have time to read, what, what do you usually turn to? Uh, I like biography. Uh, more so than ever. Um, so I can see a couple of yours on the wall there. The one of Lincoln by oh, yeah. Donald. Herbert. Donald. I think I have a Boyd book. You mentioned Boyd. I got Boyd somewhere back there. Yeah, Boyd. So look, I, I love, love political biography. I've just finished um, H.W. Brand's Reagan. Um, I'm currently reading Ronald C. White's uh, Ulysses Grant, a great book. Um, I do like fiction. Um, one of my all-time favorite novels is Cormac McCarthy's The Road which I think ah. is, is like the ultimate conservative novel. Um, <laughs> if you destroy society, right, and all its structures, and you start over, what do you start with? And it's human relationships. And so the story is about wow. the father and the son moving from the, the north of America down to, to the south. And it's the love at the heart of that relationship, right? And this, this, the father says to the son, you know, your job is to carry the, our job is to carry the fire, meaning civilization. And um, so that's probably, I, I use that a lot on the wow. stump, right? Because it's a powerful metaphor for what I'm trying to do, which is just carry the fire. You and I, who knows how long we might be in office for, but I like that. Um, whilst we're there, we've got to carry the fire and then pass it on to whoever follows. Well said. Did you first read that before or after you were a father yourself? Um, I actually read it as my C-17 took off from Afghanistan for the last time in 2013. Wow, um, <laughs> man, it was it was it was amazing. Yeah, really you know, powerful. Most people, when they're done with the deployment, 
you know, want to read something fun, light, you chose a post-apocalyptic, <laughs> super dark. Well, I guess by your interpretation, it's not. It's got a hopeful, a hopeful uh, message. Yeah, that's right. Well, I mean, you would know what it's like, nation building, um, uh, which which I thought was a, an ultimately futile um, enterprise. But I just I, I, I came away thinking to myself, wow, we are so blessed to live in countries that have rule of law, checks and balances and basic infrastructure that functions. And so it was with that mindset that I that I came to the road. But yeah, um, I like PG Wodehouse. Always fun. Um, I love um, Bonfire of the Vanities by by Tom Wolfe. Great great Wall Street novel. Um, and just general history, you know. Um, you can learn a lot through experience of others. So let's go lowbrow here quickly. Yeah. Okay, so you can't be reading and serious all the time. Plus, you got kids. You know, they're running around. Let's say you just you you want to veg out. Let's talk movies, TV shows, anything you've binged that you you'd recommend. You know, be honest here. Yeah, sure. Okay, so Netflix, uh, Drive to Survive, Formula One, season one and two. Interesting. Um, I love Formula One. Um, we're in a very good time zone for Formula One. So every race in Europe starts on a Sunday night at 9, 10 p.m. Um, I love the drama. I love the politics of the drivers. I love the, the engineering and the science of the cars. And I love the teamwork, right? Nothing better than a pit stop that gets done in less than two seconds. Um, so Netflix really um, did a great documentary on that. Um, and I've been doing period dramas with my wife, would you believe? I just nailed <laughs> Pride and Prejudice and Sense and Sensibility. No shame in that. There's no shame in that. <laughs> um, I'm home, so I'm, I'm, I'm doing as much as I can to make up for the time that I'm away. Um, but, yeah, I, I just, I'm a, is there I just a, love it, Yeah, is there a good I, – I can't – and I'm not like a super fancy operator like you are, but – it's hard to watch military movies sometimes because they always just get like the most basic things wrong. Yeah. Like whenever there's a Marine Corps movie, it's like they don't have a haircut. And like that's the most basic thing about the Marine Corps. You have to get a haircut every week. And like so someone walking around with sideburns is not a Marine. And I'm always thinking they could have hired me and I, at just 50 bucks a week, I would have told them just get a haircut. Um, exactly. You would have told me Any good Australian military movie out there? Uh, Can't think of one. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there's one on Long Tan, the Battle of Long Tan, um, which was recently released about a year or so ago, which is which is pretty good about our most yeah. famous battle in Vietnam. Um, the Odd Angry Shot, which is about the SAS in Vietnam. I've heard about this. Mel Gibson did uh, Z Force, I think, in the 80s, which is about Australian commandos in yeah. Uh, New Guinea or Timor. Gallipoli, I guess, with Mel Gibson. Yeah, oh, I mean, yeah. Gallip Gallipoli, hands down, right? That's, yeah. That is the Australian war movie. Yeah. Um, yeah, look, you know, Hollywood, it's hard to compete against Hollywood, right? So we send you our best actors, and then you put American accents on them, and then send them back to us in, in films. This is Speaking of foreign influence and infiltration, it is shocking how many Australian actors are dominating Hollywood. Hugh Jackman, Thor, who else? They're yep. all secretly Thor's, Australian. Thor's brother. Um, yeah, Thor's brother. <laughs> Russell Crowe, Eric Banner. Gosh. Uh, you know, and, you know, Eric Banner's play, played Delta, basically, what, in, in Black Hawk Down. That's true. That, that was his Hollywood breakout film. We couldn't so. muster up, like, an athletic American actor who could With hold a decent gun. southern accent, right? Yeah, we, we had to get an Aussie to play our heroes. This is yeah. appalling. Yeah. Oh. Uh, oh, don't get me started on that. Um, okay, so we're going to end on two serious questions here. Um, who, who have been kind of your mentors in, in your career? And what role kind of has mentorship played in, in shaping your career? Sure. So um, my father's had a big influence on me. He's actually a Presbyterian minister, but um, oh, wow. from a political perspective, um, my dad knows how to run committees because that's what Presbyterians do. That's their system of they're Democrats. That's their system of church government. But also just sitting in, in church every Sunday, listening him, listening to him preach and, and care for people from a pastoral setting in a public setting um, had a big influence on me. 
But I'd say um, in the military, um, oddly enough, I was mentored by the former commandant of the Australian Defence Force Academy, oh, wow. Rear, Admiral, Rear Admiral James Goldrick, who's, who's a, a published author in his own right and good, good friends with um, Admiral Stavridis. I think that's how you say his name. Mm -hmm. um, he took me to the US in 2004 to, the, to Bethesda for a, a military history conference and then took me down to, um, took me up to Annapolis, I think it is. Um, um, to the military academy there, and he and I have just sort of he's intellectually mentored me on strategic issues for you know more than 15 years. Um, and then awesome. politically, a, a former deputy prime minister, you know, a guy who I can call up and say, Man, I've had a rough day in parliament, and I don't have to explain much because he's lived it, he's been there, he's he's had the highs and the lows of public life, and he's someone who can just talk hard truths to me, right? Because in this game. Yeah. A lot of people tell you you're awesome and um, you really need people in your life who say, hey, that wasn't so good, buddy. Yeah, don't drink your own Kool-Aid. Um, okay, so let's say you walk into a bar. In, when you come to visit Wisconsin, you come to a Packers game, you walk into a bar with me and some kid comes up to you and he's like, are you Andrew Hasty? Are you H? I'm a huge fan of Australian politics, randomly, even though I live in Northeast Wisconsin. I'm really interested in going into public service. What advice would you have for me, Mr. Mr. H-Man? I would say it's absolutely a good thing to want to serve your country. And in your 20s, serve your country in roles that are, are more um, about service in the, in the, in the quieter sense and um, seek responsibility, seek to take decisions and put yourself under pressure. Because if you do go into public service in, in politics, where uh, it's a much bigger stage, you want to be able to draw on the experiences from your 20s and um, some of the lessons you've acquired there. And so if you, if you live kind of a soft 20s, um, you won't be prepared for what's next in your 30s, particularly if it's politics. Um, and, and service in the military is a great way to learn hands-on leadership, to, to get all the edges knocked off you by, by soldiers, sailors, or airmen who, who you know, give their leadership, uh, give, give, follow a leader, but, but not straight away. You've got to earn their, their respect. Um, and that's what I tell most young people who, who come to me. Um, you know, do something tough in your 20s and um, don't be afraid to take risks. Fantastic advice from Andrew Hasty. A warrior, a scholar, and a leader in every sense of the term. Thank you for making time. This is awesome, and I look forward to seeing you in person again soon. Mike, it's always a pleasure, mate. Thanks for setting this up. All right.